Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We have the pleasure of having Jenny Dearborn with us today. Jenny is the Chief Learning Officer of the software company SAP, and she's also author of the book, Data Driven, How Performance Analytics Deliver Extraordinary Results, and she's here to tell us more. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So start off by telling us about your work experience and how you got to where you are today. Well, I am the Chief Learning Officer at SAP, and I came to that role through a series of steps along the way. So going way back, I started as a high school English public speaking, drama and creative writing teacher. So I did that for a couple years, uh, but uh, only long enough to realize that I was not very good at that and needed to move on to something else. So I moved into corporate education. My first corporate job was at Hewlett Packard as an instructor. So I taught all the professional development classes and management leadership classes, things like that, and sort of just worked my way up. Um, through the ranks of different training jobs and learning jobs and corporate education jobs at different companies, always based in Silicon Valley. I've always had global roles with a global scope, always traveled about 50% of my time, always in tech. I didn't really choose tech, it sort of check tech chose me because of where I'm based in Silicon Valley and that's what's around, so that's what I kind of fell into. But I really, really love technology. Tell us about your role as Chief Learning Officer for SAP. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so um, I manage the learning function internally. Um, so I'm responsible for all internal employee learnings, about 75,000 employees globally. And so all learning, education readiness that employees need to be successful in their jobs, starting with onboarding, professional development, management, leadership, compliance, strategy, diversity and inclusion, a whole range of topics. There are separate functional learning teams also that are a dotted line report to me that reside in the business. They typically are in the operations of the business. So there's one in the sales operations, there's one in services operations. And so we have a federated model where I drive all the content that is horizontal across the corporation. And then there's learning in each of the business units. And they focus on the learning that is specific and unique to the employees in that business unit. We want to learn more about how you've created a learning organization within SAP. So start off by telling us how you would define what a learning organization is. Um, my, I have a very clear in my mind definition of a learning organization. It's, a, it's an organization that is um, highly aligned to the corporate strategy and objectives. So it's, it's really learning when it's done well is a very clear execution of a strategic workforce plan. So you start with a corporate strategy, corporate objectives, corporate goals, clearly understanding where the corporation wants to be um, in you know, 2020, 2025, whatever that is, this margin, these product lines and these geographies or wh whatever that is for your organization. And then aligning the workforce plan and then aligning the uh, learning and talent development execution to drive that. So a learning culture is a culture that is learning all the time. It is absorbing new information and changing dynamically all the time. Where learning is not an event that is once a quarter or once a year or something like that, but is sort of an organically part of the DNA of an organization. And that people are always learning and changing and, and absorbing information in alignment with where the corporation wants to go uh, to achieve its business strategy. Tell us more about building that learning culture. What behaviors do you promote mm -hmm. to build a learning culture? So I think it's it's um, eliminating some of the barriers to learning that sometimes exist at different corporations. If you are in a corporation where learning is very event-based, um, it's adjusting the corporation's expectations so that they come to see learning differently and really educating your clients, your internal stakeholders that learning and training are quite different. Learning is something that happens all the time and it's you know this um, experiential, on the job, um, you know, endless um, uh, sort of state of mind and training is sometimes events. Um, and so a lot of times adjusting a learning culture is really educating clients, um, educating your stakeholders on how that new world sort of works. And then really getting leaders and managers involved in that learning experience. So in a lot of my clients that I work with, external companies, you know, they'll say, how do I build a learning culture? I say, well, 
you know, first I ask, well, tell me about how engaged your stakeholders are. Tell me about their involvement in the learning experiences. Are they doing kickoffs? Are they sending out welcome letters? Are they encouraging employees to go? Are they putting up barriers to, you know, consuming the learning? A lot of times, you could have a corporation could have really great learning programs and that are really well received by employees and even have really great business impact metrics like people who attended this class have great results compared to people who didn't attend the class in the same role you know you could you can do a really nice comparison of the impact um, but the leaders don't al really allow employees to consume it because they don't give them time off the job, they manage them to utilization rates that are unrealistic, things like that. So it's really educating the clients and the stakeholders about their role and their engagement and involvement in making sure the learning culture really sticks. Tell us about some of the resources that you need to build a learning organization. What percentage of your revenues are dedicated to learning and development? So it's going to be different for each uh, corporation uh, based on the sort of the functional um, role that that corporation is going to be playing. So, you, for example, professional services organizations like the Accentures and the Deloitte's and ENY and things like that are going to have a much higher percentage of their revenue uh, aligned to the, the ongoing development of their staff because they are a very people-focused organization. Um, and then down at the other end of the spectrum is going to be a, a corporation that is very capital equipment intensive and less focused on people. So you'll see a broad range of the percentage of revenue that's spent on learning. Um, at SAP, we have um, 100 million euros that's set aside for learning um, in 2015. So yes. it's a very handsome amount uh, for the benefit of our employees. Tell us more about how you create learning plans. How do you create learning plans for individuals and teams and then for the organization as a whole? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the learning industry is really evolving. We would say, I've been in this space for a long time, over 20 years, so I would say 15 years ago, we talked quite a bit about role-based learning and that was quite a breakthrough at the time that learning was um, you know, all first level sales managers needed this course. Um, or, you know, everybody who is a call center agent, you know, as a vertical would need this course. And that was a significant advancement from how it was structured previously. Going back in history, how it was previously structured was just an open catalog. And every employee had, you know, $5,000 in their pocket to spend on their development for the year or something like that. And they would say with their manager, I think I need this or I think I need that or I'm going to sign up for this. And it was, you know, a little bit ad hoc. And then we move forward to role-based learning. And now we're really trying to get to is a very prescriptive approach so that it's highly customized to the individual competency needs and skill gaps of an individual. So you might be a first level sales manager, you're in that role, but you don't need that particular course that someone is saying all first level managers need because you already have expertise and competence in that space. And we really need to think about learning funds as a, a finite resource. They're, they're not infinite. They cannot keep expanding forever. Um, and as margins get tight moving forward and learning styles change, we need to be very careful about um, sending people to to learning programs that they don't need. Um, so being very careful to make sure that we're developing learning programs that are highly aligned to the unique and specialized needs of the individual is really where the industry is going and that's something that we practice internally. What are the organization's current learning goals? Well, they're going to be um, very specific to each, uh, each of the business units. So for sales, it's you know, increased margin, increased revenue, decreasing cost of goods sold, you know, increase the number of products bundled into each opportunity, share of wallet, things like that. So those are going to be very specific business goals for sales, for example. And so you're really working with your clients to understand, you know, what are their business dashboard? What are the very specific business goals and objectives for each of those business units? When I work with folks, I try to um, discourage a reporting of vanity metrics, which is the number of hours learned, the number of training courses consumed, the dollars per learner, you know, which is, it's basic math, right? You take your overall budget and you divide it out by the number of people that consumed it and that's your dollars, you know. Um, and I've had so many business clients 
um, over the years. You know, this one time when I was at Hewlett Packard and and I was very proud of these metrics that I was showing and and I was um, said, you know, this many, I was in my slide and I said, you know, this many, you know, thousands of, of sales reps took this class and they gave it a 4.5 out of 5 stars. This many hundreds of sales reps took this class and they gave it a 4.7 out of 5 stars and isn't this great and my my client says just all I know for sure is you've wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. I don't have any evidence at all that what you're doing has made a darn bit of difference except there was a different expletive there instead of darn. <laughs> um, and so I, I, it became very clear to me that um, my job, if I'm doing my job well, is not to report on volume. It's really to report on business impact and what I'm able to change in the business by increasing the readiness um, of the workforce. So working very closely with, um, with clients to establish that, you know, it's going to be very specific for each particular client. How do you measure learning outcome? What are some of the metrics that you use within SAP? Yeah, well, I just mentioned a lot of them. Um, you know, so for business, so for sales, it's you know revenue, time to market. Every program that we roll out is tied to a business metric. Um, and I tell my staff and my clients, we can't establish what the business metric is that we're trying to uh, address. You know, what's broken? Um, then there's really no need for me to develop a training program for you, right? I've had clients who have come to me at, at, in past companies and say, I, you know, I need you to roll out a, a program, like, you know, at a past company, someone who was the head of strategy. I need you to roll out a, a program so that everybody in the corporation understands the strategy. So, well, you know, I know the answer in my head, but I wanted to hear it. Well, why is that important? Well, everyone needs to know the strategy. Okay, but why? Well, so they can talk about it at a barbecue. Okay, but why? Well, they just need to know it. Okay, but show me on your dashboard what's red that you would like to turn green because people don't understand what the corporate strategy is. And what, what does understand the corporate strategy actually mean? Like what is the behavior you'd like to see? What are the actions you'd like to see from people? Let's say they do understand it. What will they be doing differently and how will you measure that, right? So every learning program that we put out, we work very closely with the client to articulate that. So there's a, there's a good deal of performance consulting up front. Um, you know, an audience needs analysis to understand, well, what are you actually trying to change? And because the answer might be, you need a white paper, you need a communication to send out an email. You know, a lot of times the answer is not a training event. It might be, uh, but if I'm gonna go build something, I need to know what success looks like for the learners that are consuming this training event after it's been consumed, right? Um, and if I don't have that, I'm wasting my client's time and I'm, and I'm burning bridges of trust with my learners because I'm the lady that told them to go take something and then they did and then they couldn't figure out why they did, right? And the next time I tell them to take something, they probably won't, right? So I have to be very careful that what we're doing is actually lining up to business, business results. How does SAP develop competency models? What is the process that you use to do that? So we work closely with the leaders of the business that are um, leading those various roles um, to understand how is that role gonna be changing. We also employ um, outside um, resources, consultants, strategists to sort of understand, well, where is the world going? You know, what does the future look like? What's around the corner? How does this particular role um, or group of people uh, need to adapt moving forward? So it's a lot of input from all these various places and, and you know, really looking closely at the different um, skills, expectations, um, experiences that are needed, looking for things that are um, quite specific, trying to stay away from, you know, vague, um, overarching terms, um, you know, needs to be resourceful, you know, boil that down a little bit, like what exactly does that mean, how will you know it when you see it, and trying to make it fairly crisp. Um, and also think a lot of corporations get quite hung up when they have, um, in their job architecture framework, they have too many different roles, they have too many different competencies, and um, it becomes so specific to the individual that you can't aggregate it at all, you know? So we try to make sure that it doesn't get too big and overwhelming, right. so. You also talked a little bit about how much learning has changed, the way people learn, learning programs. What learning methods have you found effective and which ones are you using more of now yeah. at SAP? Um, 
so I think we've had a, uh, interesting shifts in trends over the years. There used to be, you know, really a huge focus on instructor-led learning 15 years ago, and that was really the only way that learning happened. Um, and then, you know, so it was really sort of a delivery-centric model. You know, that's how I started. I started out as an instructor because I had a drama background, and so that was, oh, put her on a stage, that'll be fine. And then it really moved to a design model when the internet came online and we started having instructional design and web-based learning and things like that. So really the design became very important for distance-based learning. Now we really see sort of a governance based model where you've got learning coming from every possible source um, and you really can't control it anymore. It's not the command and control learning department is the center of the universe anymore. You need to have a platform that's open to everything. So instructional design continues to be incredibly important moving forward. There's a lot of interesting research out there that says um, instructional design really is, you know, one of the most important skills and skill sets that uh, learning professionals need moving forward. So instructor-led learning continues to be incredibly important, but it needs to be very carefully used and used uh, in very specific situations when a very clear desired outcome is needed. And if you're going to bring people together, it needs to be experiential, role-based, gamified scenarios and um, business simulations, extremely interactive. You're, you're taking people's precious time and flying them from wherever to a central spot. Um, it needs to be a highly engaging experience. So the instructional designer is incredibly important to say when is it paramount for that experience to occur. And if you're going to bring people together, it needs to have that in incredibly engaging foundation. And then the instructional designer um, can also look at the needs analysis from the client and the expected business outcomes and say, when can we use a white paper, a webinar, you know, some other virtual format, things like that. So to answer your question, um, we employ all methodologies um, and uh, have found a lot of uh, fun lately in, in apps and MOOCs and things like that um, because people find that really interesting and that's really fun and it has a very specific purpose to address a very specific need. But I think just the importance of a, a highly professional instructional design team to understand what is appropriate, what methodology fits, what kind of content at what particular time for which particular audience uh, according to the business outcomes you're expecting. Do you find that various workforce generations are better engaged with certain learning methods than others or um, not? I think there was some thought at first when there was a lot of research originally coming out five, seven years ago about the millennials and they're so different and they really need engaging content and they really need coaching and then after a while you're, well, I'm a Gen Xer, I'd like that too. And my baby boomer neighbor is like, well, I'd like that too. I think, you know, what the millennials are, are doing, which is really positive, is bringing forward the conversation about the importance of different types of learning modalities that are beneficial to everybody. So when you step back from the hyperbole and the overexcitement, you find out that the needs are, are the same across the different generations. I don't see anybody who, there's more similarity in the, your industry vertical. So people in tech tend to be more similar regardless of generation. People in retail tend to be more similar in terms of their learning preferences regardless of generation. So that's, that's where you will see that differentiation, but um, that's nothing different than what we've had in the past. How has globalization and technology change the way things operate within a learning organization. Technology's had a wonderful influence on learning because it's opened up so many opportunities um, to try different approaches and to be really smart about what learning is delivered to whom and when and for what purpose. Um, so there's great platforms out there that are available um, and it's had a, a very positive impact. Um, there was some concern several years ago when technology first came out that it's it will depersonalize learning. Um, I think we've gotten over that as an industry um, and and really just universally see the benefits. I mean, there's uh, there's basic technology, just let's get our stuff organized, let's figure out who's doing what and when they're doing it and um, and things like that. And once a company kind of gets comfortable with the basics, it's really time for them to say, well, you know, how can we 
take advantage of this technology and produce something that's really cool and interesting and fun and engaging and produces great business impact results also. How does SAP manage learning operation in terms of content, delivery, technology, administration? Can you talk sure. a little bit more sure. about that? So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my organizational structure. So um, I have um, a team that does uh, business operations, which is like budgeting and uh, planning and things like that. So that's one of my leaders. The, my leaders on my team are vice presidents. So one of the, my vice presidents does that. And then also on the, I have one person that is systems, vice president of systems, that is more back end and like really a deeper technology and how does the technology integrate with other modules and the reporting that happens. And then I have another vice president that is technology that is more front end, that is more has a sensibility of a designer as opposed to a programmer, if that makes sense. So that person is really looking out for the user experience, um, knowing that um, across human resources, technology platforms within a corporation learning is the technology that most employees touch the, the most frequently so for example in different HR if you are doing compensation module in your HR system you'll touch that module once a year if you're doing performance management module in your HR software you'll touch that between four, one and four times a year. Um, but if you have a learning module in your HR software in your corporation, you could touch that every day or multiple times a day. So it really is one of the strongest um, brand opportunities and communicating the brand of the corporation and the brand of human resources to your employees. Um, so that employee experience is incredibly important um, for communicating the culture and um, you know the values of the corporation things like that making sure that that's a comfortable and positive user experience is very important so I have um, one of my leaders that drives that user experience my other leaders are one that does design and development and one that does delivery um, so design and development are a team of instructional designers, artists, graphic artists, um, programmers. They're very artistic and uh, it's important to me that those folks don't get dragged down in the minutia of budgeting and things like that because I need them to keep their creative spirit high um, and be able to um, really unleash that positive creativity of what if and how could the world be better and things like that. So I try and uh, offload onto the operations team some of the harder, traditionally harder aspects of project management so the designers can stay very, very creative. Um, and then my delivery team are instructors and facilitators who travel probably 50 to 75 percent of the time um, and they take the job knowing that they'll be traveling instructors and um, so for the sm small percentage of our total curriculum that is instructor-led that in those instructor-led experiences happen from the facilitation team and they are traveling around the world full-time. Tell us how chief learning officers can stay relevant in the future. Uh, chief learning officers moving forward need to be very comfortable with data analytics. Um, I would say the same message to chief human resources officers. So there's interesting research that's, that's just come out about the CHRO role that starting in 2015, 50% of newly appointed CHROs do not come from HR. They're not rising through the ranks in HR and then get that final top job. They come from marketing and finance and operations and sales and just about any other place other than HR. And the number one reason why the person who rose through the ranks in HR is not getting that top job is because of data and analytics, because they're not comfortable with that. There is an expectation from the corporation that CHRO can you know, pull all the different data sources available and step back from it and put together an algorithm and a model and say, here's where our workforce is going. Here's what we need to do moving forward. You know, these are the significant trends that we need to look out for. So I would say the same thing applies to the CLO. There's a tremendous amount of transactional data that occurs in the learning function and most CLOs really don't know what to do with that. They basically report on what I did at Hewlett Packard that you know, got me kicked out of the room, which is, you know, 
this many thousands of people took this course and they gave it a 4.5 out of 5 stars and we did it in the time frame we said we were going to do it, who cares? I mean, really, I, I don't know if that made any difference at all. You know, it's possible that those thousands of people that just took that class are actually worse off than they were before and they're producing, you know, less quality results. We actually don't know. So we need to get really comfortable as a profession with how to triangulate data sources, how to ask the right questions of the data, and then how to use that data to, to get us what we need, to get us the business results we need. As a leader in the technology industry, do you think a skills gap exists in the sector? And if so, why? It's different in different parts of the world. Um, some, uh, in just some parts of tech move faster than others. Um, I think for the most part, we are not comfortable as a profession, again, with data and analytics and, and the implications of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we move very fast, which is good, but then we also then could do more, should do more to balance that with um, ethical questions about what is the right thing to do with this data. If you don't have um, privacy constraints or works council constraints, if you're basically a small North American company, um, you can ask very compelling questions from the data that you have gathered about your employees or your clients or your customers or consumers or whatever. And then you also need to say, but is that the right thing? to be asking that? Is this violating any sort of privacy concerns? Is this, are we doing more than just understanding about our customers so we can better market to them? Are we stepping over some lines? So w parts of technology are moving very fast from a technology perspective, but they're not taking into consideration those ethical questions. Some parts of technology are moving slow because they're thinking deeply about those ethical questions, but they're not yet caught up from a technology perspective. So I think it will balance out with time, but there are these definitely these two polarized forces. So then how can CLOs help build technology talent in the future? It's very important for the, the learning function to be asking these tough questions. Um, the learning function needs to understand the corporate strategy and ask these hard questions of the corporate executives, of those senior clients. Where are we going? Um, what is our comfort level with privacy? How much information do we need to know about our employees? Um, you know, are we concerned that our employees are not able to keep up with the future? What does the overall market trend look like? Are we a um, an on-premise software company? Are we a cloud software company? Are we a hardware manufacturing company? What is that balance and what do we need to know? So I think there's um, a lot of opportunities for the learning professionals to be putting up a mirror and asking the corporation tough questions. Mm -hmm. I see that as my role. Now, we also talk to leaders about how mentors have helped shape their lives and their careers but you've spoken about the difference between coaches, mentors, and sponsors in helping somebody shape their career. Tell us more. For the person in my life, my guardian angel, I'm gonna roll it all together, coach, mentor, sponsor. So I had my first executive job at Sun Microsystems, and that was um, from my manager at the time, uh, Carrie Williard, Dr. Carrie Williard. And you know she saw in me sort of talent and enthusiasm and, and competence and said, I have a job for you that I think you'd be really good at. Him. Okay. And um, I did that role for a while and, and then I, when I got to the point where I was really comfortable and good at it and, and she said, I think it's time for you to do something bigger. Oh, okay. I, didn't, I wasn't expecting that and then she pulled me up into a bigger role and I did that for a couple of years and, and then there was no bigger role in her organization and she said, I think it's time for you to go look at something else, and she was being recruited for roles at her level at other companies, and so she started then sending me outside the company. And it really drove home for me uh, the point about caring about the individual and not hoarding talent. And, you know, sometimes the best thing for that person is, is to leave the organization and take their talent elsewhere. Um, and I did that. I went to another company for three years, something like that. And then she left and went to another company. And then when she called me at another company, she said, why don't you come on over? And I, 
I did in an instant because I had never had a, anyone that was more attuned to my career. Um, and so I really go out of my way to try and do that for my employees and do what's best for them as people because I know it will come back and reward me and the corporation later. I think um, hoarding talent is um, probably one of the most selfish and self-destructive things that a leader can do. It is our primary job to develop others and invest in the skills and the, and the joy and the development and the sense of meaning and self-worth of other people. Yeah, there's a special place in hell for bad managers. Bad manager um, will have devastating effects on that employee's life and their family and it has negative ripple effects you know throughout communities of people so a mentor is someone that you connect with and if you're my mentor I'm gonna come to you once a month or once a quarter and I'm gonna say what do you think I should do about this what do you think I should do about that right I'm asking for advice if you are my coach I may not notice that I'm doing something that needs to be corrected, but as my coach, you're gonna come say, put your elbow up a little bit more, straighten your back, you know, lift up your outside leg, you know, take a step with the swing, right? I didn't know that I was doing that. I didn't know that I needed that, but as my coach, you're going to fine tune, you're gonna look for opportunities to make corrections. The mentee drives the conversation with the mentor. The coach drives the coaching feedback with the coachee. Is that a word, coachy? I don't know. Um, but then a sponsor is someone that says, I'm going to take it upon myself to find opportunities for you, right? If you're my sponsor, you're going to proactively open doors for me. You're going to make meetings for me. You're going to be thinking about me all the time. And you're going to be thinking when you're in a meeting with someplace else, you're going to, you're going to drop my name. You say, you know what? Jenny would be really good on this project. I'm going to make sure and then you're gonna you're gonna like pull me along. You're gonna push you know you're gonna push me out of my comfort zone, right? Um, so it's sort of increasing levels of of engagement, right? From a mentor to a coach to a sponsor. You've also talked about how diversity and inclusion of women is important for businesses to grow and to thrive. Tell us more about that. Well, it's really diversity of of um, the workforce overall. So it's gender diversity, ethnic diversity, generational diversity, um, different abilities, different you know, backgrounds, sexual orientation, sexual identity. Worldwide, we have a significant talent crisis. There is not enough skilled employees in, in every country to meet the needs of the, of the growing workforce. Um, and so if we focus our talent acquisition strategy in a really narrow sector of the workforce, you know, white men that, you know, went to college in this very certain, you know, way, we're gonna be missing out. Uh, we, all corporations, are gonna be missing out. So all corporations need to broaden their um, understanding of, of uh, where is the right groups to pull from um, and look for gender diversity, ethnic diversity, socioeconomic, all of these different backgrounds. So it's business critical. It's good business. It's not just the right thing to do for you know, a healthy society, but it's the right thing to do for corporations to be profitable and, and successful moving forward. So your book talks about how important it is for leaders to understand the power of data and analytics to optimize their sales functions. Tell us more about this. It was an untapped space for a really long time. I think sales leaders, I've supported a lot of sales leaders in my past and I've been in sales myself and it's a lot of operating from gut instinct. It's a lot of um, cowboy behavior and you know, I don't need a plan. I can write out my account plan on a post-it note and I'm good to go, kind of. Um, it's less of that, um, but you still find it every once in a while and you're like, oh my gosh. Um, so it, it's really around um, how to optimize the workforce that you already have. And st we still see, you know, leaders, you know, the characters that I write about in the book are, are fictitious characters, but they're absolutely based on like hundreds of people that I know that still operate this way, um, <clears throat> where they hire a group of sales reps, they don't really train them or onboard them well, they're not meeting their quota, and their instinct is to flush them and get new ones. And, you know, we could get greater results 
by being more attuned to the people that we have, their unique skills and competencies that they already have, their unique talent gaps, um, and you know, putting a learning intervention to address those very specific gaps, aligning that to business strategy and objectives, you know, and really helping people to be more effective and productive moving forward. So a corporation can get revenue from you know, taking the products that they already have, you know, additional revenue by taking the products they already have to a new market, taking, you know, so it's new market or existing market new products, right? So I'm in the United States, I'm gonna go invent a net new thing to take to sell in the United States, or I can figure out how to take the humans that I have and make them more efficient, make them more effective, make them more productive. And so that's really what the book is about, um, is really tapping into your workforce to get that um, that success from what you already have as opposed to going inventing something new. Who would benefit most from reading your book? Uh, the hero of the story is is human resources but I intended the book for a sales audience. When I speak about the book at conferences and things like that I'm often asked to speak about it um, at a sales conference or I'm asked to speak about the book at a human resources conference to, to an HR audience. And so I say to the sales audience, um, this is what you should expect of HR, right, of learning. They can do this, they should do this, they don't know how to do this, but they have the capability and the resources available. You need to demand that they rise to that occasion, and here are the tools to go make that happen, right? You should be asking these questions. And then I present to the HR audience, and I say, guess what I just told your boss, right? Guess what I just told your client? that basically if you're not doing this, you should be fired because you're not serving your client's needs, right? Your client needs you to drive greater productivity of the workforce and you're not really doing it, but here's how, right? So I wanted the message to be to business leaders about HR, but I knew if I wrote the book to the HR professionals that business leaders, the sales leaders wouldn't read it. So, it's a sales book about HR, if that makes sense. Why did you decide to write the book? I'm a high functioning introvert and um, I get great comfort in data and analytics and that's kind of my go-to happy place is, is, is really nerding out with spreadsheets and numbers and things like that. So I wanted to write about an area of expertise that I was exploring um, and I was getting really great results at work and with some of my clients that I work with externally and we were putting these models in, in place and getting phenomenal results and I was starting to write about the results and winning awards about them and writing about them in blogs and articles and you know doing conferences and things like that and it was just this swarm of people at a conference you know, when I'm done, you know, at, around the, the lectern, and they would basically say, where did you learn this? How did you come to know this? Where, you know, and I, I we just figured it out. And, and so when people kept asking me, what book did I read to learn how to do what I was talking about, that made me realize that there was a book here and that I had, I had something unique that I had created that needed to be shared, so. Start off by telling us about your prescriptive action model that you and your team created. Yeah, so um, it is really a, a, a framework to think about the questions that you ask your clients. Um, and it walks you through the four levels of analytics and what are the, the business questions that you're asking along the way and the different learning interventions that you can put in along the way. So it's um, uh, descriptive, diagnostic, uh, predictive, and prescriptive. So you sort of walk through the different levels of analytics. Um, and uh, there's different mathematical models that you apply along the way and different business questions that you're asking along the way to sort of as you become more, more mature as a business function. So your book uses a fictitious company yeah. to lay out these problems of stagnant sales and how different functions are faulting each other and that first chapter is titled Playing the Blame Game. Yeah. And it talks about the dangers of making decisions without the right data. Right? So tell us more about the first steps that leaders should take to address this. 
in the book, it's, it starts out where um, they have a significant problem and nobody really can figure out why the problem is the way it is and how everyone is looking at the same data and information, but they all draw really different conclusions from that. And this happens all the time in real life, right? So one of the first things that leaders uh, should do is put all the data that they have available out on the table um, and you know, take a clean look at all the different data sources that are available and then take a step back and say, what business problem are we trying to solve? Like what really is the problem here? And from all the different data that we have, is there anything here that can shed light on that business problem? Quick example that had happened recently. So um, where data can be quite misleading at work, my team teaches a new hire sales orientation class. And there's 50 people per class and it's once a month. You can have it on the 11th floor, which is beautiful, brand new high rise on the, looking out of the San Francisco Bay and the sparkling water and the sunshine is great sort of startup energy and this great fun environment. Um, and then because of scheduling, because the rooms are booked, the next month I have to put it in the basement which is this cavernous, cold, high ceilings, no windows, horrible environment. Same instructor, same case study, same business simulation, same catering, same homework, same guest speakers, like everything's exactly the same. And then one month, 11th floor, one month basement, back and forth, back and forth. And then we started getting results, or we started getting feedback that the people that went to the class in the basement, it was the worst class they ever had. Best class, worst class, best class, worst class. And so my instructor was saying, we have to, we can't teach in the basement anymore. It's, it's a terrible class. And then I, and they said, well, what we're going to have to do is have this huge backlog of, of untrained sales reps because we can only teach every other month, which means all, you know, this, this backlog is just going to grow and grow. I said, okay, well, let's look at the data, right? So if I only looked at level one evaluation scores, for these two classes, I would say the data is telling me that this is a terrible class and we should, it's better to have a backlog than to have this miserable experience. Well, let's look at the data. Now, my learning program is designed to drive business results, right? Not level one evaluation scores. So when I look at the, you know, early stage pipe, late stage pipe, close rate, you know, time to first deal, number of opportunities closed, you know, in the number of uh, products bundled in the opportunity, discount rate, all of that for the 11th floor in the basement. What did I find? You tell me. There was none. There's no difference. None. None. I'm not in the business of trying to make learners miserable, but I just tell people bring a parka, right? It's cold, you know, but at the end of the day, what's more important is that you've learned what you needed to learn and that you can go out into the field and do really well and you'd be really successful in your job, right? So I think business leaders, if we look at some data, we can draw the wrong conclusions. We need to look at all the data and dig into it and understand, well, what is our ultimate business problem that we're trying to address? And it's gonna be different for each functional area, but that's, that's a great place to start is just by taking a really broad look at the data available. People who aren't familiar with the world of data can become frustrated or overwhelmed by it. So how does your book help guide leaders through this challenge? Well, I think, I hope, it's an engaging story. I've been told it's an engaging story. It's a little bit funny and easy to get involved, emotionally involved when, in these set of characters. They're easily identifiable. We did that on purpose to really handhold people through the steps. The first time we wrote the book was basically a you know, a manual or a textbook of, you know, run this report, ask these questions, you know, run this algorithm, you know, have this client conversation. And it was sort of a step-by-step -step guide. It was, oh, so tedious and boring. So we knew we needed to, in order for it to be, I mean, it's ultimately a teaching tool, right? In order for it to teach and really engage, we needed to use um, what we call, what, what's called didactic fiction, which is, you know, a story meant to inform. Um, and um, so we're hoping that that format really gets the messages across in a fun way. What do you recommend to leaders who want to start a data analytics transformation, but it's not already a practice within their organization? In the book, we kind of walk through it. So find all the data that is, that is currently available to you. 
and you know do some industry benchmarking um, to understand you know what other organizations are doing in terms of the data that they are gathering. Um, Pick a, a very specific project where you want to do a pilot, and you know, sort of start small. Um, you need to potentially engage a consultant to help you understand what are the right business questions to be asking of your organization. What what business we walk through it in the book, but you know, what are the what business challenges am I trying to solve? What's my ultimate goal? You know, how do I line up with the corporate structure, or the corporate strategy, things like that. So, the, you know, the big takeaways are start with a pilot. Make sure you have really great executive support. Make sure you have the data available to you if you've got people who are hoarding data or hiding data or obscuring um, or that your systems just really pull bad reports. You know, you've got some challenges there. Um, so those are some places to start. Can you talk a little bit about the costs associated with a data analytics transformation and then the, the process of maintaining that? It can really vary. Um, what I've done with some companies is actually qu quite reasonable. So when you do start a pilot, um, it is extra horsepower from your team. When I first did my first pilot, probably I hired a consulting, a small boutique consulting company maybe spend $100,000 over the course of a year uh, for this person to really train up myself and my staff on um, how to go about thinking about our work differently, what reports to run, where to pull that data, what to do with it, how to ask the right business questions, things like that. And that kind of got us started with a pilot that we could then grow to other programs that we could then run ourselves. Um, if you want to outsource the whole thing to a very established corporation or established uh, consultancy, you could end up spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It could be quite a lot. Your book also lays out the steps needed to begin improving the sales process, starting with a key performance indicators map. Um, tell us about the steps in the process. So we sort of touched on that a little bit, where you, you um, uh, start by working with your corporate executive team to understand the business goals and objectives of the overall corporation. You start with, you know, what are the KPIs of the, you know, you know of where your company is going, right? How is your corporation going to measure success for itself? That's not something that you as a learning professional can do, right? That's, you need to go to the CEO, his or her direct staff, your board of directors or something like that. And they should have that, I mean they do. Um, whether or not they want to share it with you is, is, is a different story, but they'll have it. Um, you know, we want to have this margin and this revenue and these product lines and these geographies by this date and here's how, you know, because they're, especially if they're a public company, all of that is publicly available, right? I mean, they're making commitments to the street around the uh, financial returns. So, um, so you start with that level and then you sort of break down, well, what are the leading indicators of success of this goal? Um, and then you can sort of break that down and say, well, what are the behaviors and the actions that you would see from a person who's driving those leading indicators that drive success of that goal? And then you can break that down even further and you can say, well, what are the competencies and skills of those behaviors and actions that drive that leading indicator? that drive that metric. And then you can get to the point where you can actually create learning programs that drive competencies and skills. And I think what where a lot of learning professionals get tripped up is they start with the training program and they say, what corporate strategy does this training program drive? And you really want to start with the corporate strategy and say, you know, okay, do start with a, that and then you say, get to the point of, oh, do we even need a, a learning program? Mm -hmm as opposed to starting with a learning program and trying to justify it up. You've been open about sharing how you've overcame severe learning disabilities when you were younger and how you really were able to propel yourself towards success. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you did to, yeah, sure. to get yourself to where you are today? I don't think it's anything that you ever overcome. I think you learn to um, 
you learn coping skills. I learned coping skills. Um, I'm, I'm still dyslexic to this day. I mean, it's not something you grow out of. So um, I have uh, severe dyslexia and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and then mild OCD. And um, it was absolutely debilitating as a child. I would say that K through 12 was basically wasted. In a way, now that I'm 45, in a way now I can say um, I wouldn't change that because it gave me such intense fire um, to prove myself and prove my value and make my life meaningful and do good for others where I was missed and passed over. And that intense fire and passion and energy, I wouldn't trade that. Um, but I have four kids and that are all in various levels of school and in different grades. Um, and it just sickens me to think of my kids having an experience that I went through. So it was not, it was not good times. <laughs> it was not good times. Um, but uh, as a co I was undiagnosed until I was 18 and until um, I went to a, a community college um, after high school. But I remember my mom, when I couldn't read, my mom would read everything, uh, read my textbooks out loud to me. So I have a great auditory memory, but not a strong, not visually strong in terms of reading. Um, so my mom would read books out loud to me and things like that. Um, I was an English major in college because I wanted to pick the hardest thing that was, po that was possible for me to overcome that. Um, I went into education and became a high school teacher because I wanted to, you know, because I was just, just angry and passionate about wanting to fix everything that was in place that wronged me. And so I wouldn't change that passion. But still today, I have a hard time reading things that are really long. So it's really, dr my coping mechanism is, has driven me to be uh, very on point, very precise. Um, I have, the OCD part has, I can quickly scan documents and find a typo or an error or anything that's out of alignment or a font change or anything um, in, in a millisecond. And so it's, it's become a strength for um, absolute precision around details. And then the ADD part um, is, is really a strength also because I have just untapped e energy. I mean, just constant uh, s natural source of energy for new projects, new ideas, take on more volume, more scope, you know, um, I, I just, always am driven to do more and more and more because I just don't get tired. And, um, you know, it's going to be hard. It's hard to sit still. Um, it's hard not to fidget. It's hard, to, yeah, stuff like that. It's still really hard, but, um, but I wouldn't change it. Because of all the positives. I mean, there's just brought. positives. I mean, there's, there's a lot of positives in how I approach problem solving through the dyslexia. Um, I, I see patterns um, and I see big picture really differently than I've, I always thought it was normal for me, but then it's been pointed out to me that I really approach big, big picture problem solving quite differently than other people. I've never not been dyslexic, so I don't know how other people do problem solving, but I can step away and see big pictures and patterns of numbers and sort of chart things out quite easily. So, yeah, it's it's been a blessing. Well, that was great, Jenny. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. It was fun. And we'll see you next time on Sardar TV.